All right, welcome back to ABA exam review and our BCBA task list series. Today we're continuing concepts and principles with examples of discrimination, generalization, and maintenance. You might notice on the task list, there's a good bit of repetition. That's because everything in ABA is not an individual concept or an idea. These are all fundamentals and terminology that build on each other to establish this complete science of behavior which is why you're going to see these terms over and over and over again. It doesn't mean you skip B11 because you think you know discrimination, generalization, or maintenance. That's how people get in trouble and miss easy questions on the exam. Don't skip anything. You need to be fluent in every bit of the task list and all of your terminology. All right? So that's what we're going to cover today. As always, check out behavioranalyststudy.com. Like, subscribe. When you pass, let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. Let's get going. So starting with stimulus discrimination. Stimulus discrimination is achieved when a learner responds in the presence of the SD and not the S delta, right? So if we want to establish, let's say, touch orange as the SD, how are we going to do that? Well, we might have two cards. We might have an orange card. And we might have a blue card. And if we say touch orange and our learner touches orange, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to reinforce. If they touch blue, what are we going to do? Well, no reinforcement. So what are we starting to establish? Well, we're starting to establish that in the presence of the SD touch orange, the response of touching orange is reinforced. Whereas if you touch blue in the presence of touch orange, there is no reinforcement. So touch orange becomes the SD for touching orange. It becomes the S delta for touching blue because reinforcement occurs when you touch orange and not blue. That's discrimination. And this is how we start to establish stimulus control. And so what are we discriminating between? Well, we're discriminating really between these colors. We're teaching discrimination between these stimuli, right? So differentially reinforcing responses can lead to stimulus discrimination because in this scenario, we are differentially reinforcing touching the actual orange card when we are not reinforcing the blue card. This is starting to lead to stimulus discrimination. An important thing to remember is stimulus discrimination and response differentiation are two different things. With stimulus discrimination, we are able to identify and tell the difference between one, two, three, four, five, so on, stimuli. Response differentiation is directly talking about different responses being evoked due to different types of differential reinforcement. So new responses are made, new response classes are made. Response differ differentiation is the difference between a, a high five and a handshake. Stimulus discrimination is the difference between a banana and an apple. So don't get these two confused. And when you start to talk, okay, discrimination refers to stimuli. Differentiation refers to responses. Both are established through what? Well, both are established through differential reinforcement, which can make it a little confusing. And finally, stimulus discrimination is a tight form of stimulus control. Meaning, when we get to generalization, generalization is a loose form of stimulus control because though that response is occurring in the presence of many, many different stimuli. If I have stimulus discrimination, or let's say banana, banana is only evoked really in the presence of that fruit. It's a very tight form of stimulus control. A very limited number of stimuli will evoke that word banana. So you show up to Target at 8.45 a.m. only to see a closed sign. The hours of operation say that the store doesn't open until 9 a.m. The closed sign represents what? And as a BCBA, start thinking in these terms. Don't just think SD. Start thinking SD, S delta, SD for positive reinforcement, S delta for positive reinforcement. So that closed sign, is that an SD for positive reinforcement? Well, no, because if you walk up and you see the closed sign and you try to open the door or go in the store, you're not going to get reinforcement. So it's not an SD. It's not signaling reinforcements available. What it's doing is signaling reinforcement isn't available. So it's going to be an S delta because 
through differential reinforcement, you've learned that closed signs, okay, signal reinforcement is not available. It's not an SD for negative reinforcement. Again, it's just an S delta for reinforcement. Reinforcement isn't available when the closed sign is up. So continuing, stimulus discrimination training. Again, very, very frequently you'll be doing this, um, or your technicians will be doing this, I should say. One of the most common forms of training we, we, we do in ABA, where we're teaching discrimination between different stimuli, right? And even though it sounds very simple, we know through a lot of the clients we work with, it can be a lot more difficult and it has to be systematic and empirical, okay? With that said, stimulus discrimination training consists of a multiple schedule, either a compound schedule, where responses in the presence of one stimulus condition, let's say square, are reinforced, and responses in the presence of other stimulus conditions are not, let's say, triangle. That's a terrible triangle, but not reinforced, okay? So we know if we respond in the presence of the square, reinforcement is occurring. And this goes all the way back to really Skinner's very first few experiments, right? All his experiments with the rats and the levers. The rats learn to pull the levers in certain conditions and not to pull the levers in other conditions, right? Uh, for example, if there's a square illuminated, the rat might pull the lever because reinforcement is available. If there's a triangle, they're going to learn to not pull the lever as much because not re there's no reinforcement available, right? Don't overcomplicate stimulus discrimination training. It's, it's, it's actually very intuitive when you think about it. Okay. Think about what stimulus discrimination is and how you would teach that. Well, you would teach that through dif differential reinforcement, right? You're only going to reinforce in the presence of the, the stimulus condition that you want that behavior to occur. Remember, though, when we talk about S delta and we talk a lot about differential reinforcement, we're not saying reinforcement is never delivered in the presence of the S delta. We're just saying reinforcement might never exist, but if it does, it exists at a lower rate or quality compared to the discriminative stimuli. So stimulus generalization. Again, we're going to talk again about stimulus generalization, repetitive, just get fluent in it. All right, just put in the work, okay? So we know we have stimulus generalization and response generalization. When we think about stimulus generalization, what we're really thinking about is multiple different stimuli evoking the same response. So if I have one response, okay, it's going to be evoked by stimulus one, stimulus two, stimulus three. And you can see why discrimination is a tight degree of stimulus control because you might have one stimulus evoking the response. But with generalization, it's a loose degree of stimulus control because this response is occurring everywhere right? Look at all these different stimuli evoking that same response. Now, how does stimulus, stimulus generalization occur? Well, typically, stimuli that share characteristics are more likely to gain stimulus control. So think stimulus classes. The common example is when uh, maybe your son or daughter start to learn to say mama and dada, and they say it in the presence of you or the mom, and then they go to the store and they see a lady who looks like mom, and they say mom. They're generalizing stimuli. It's a very loose degree stimulus control. It's overgeneralization, but they're still generalizing across stimuli. And why? Well, because the lady at Walmart or the store has similar characteristics to mom. That's what we're talking about. So things get trickier, right, when we have like arbitrary stimulus classes. Uh, fruit, for example, is just what I'm thinking of today. But, you know, apples and grapes don't necessarily look alike or taste alike or anything, so they're arbitrary yet they still evoke the word fruit, okay? So they're still evoking the same response. We're still generalizing across those stimuli. However, they just share less characteristics. The more characteristic stimuli share, the more likely they are to gain stimulus control. If you wanted to establish tighter stimulus control over a certain response, what might be the best course of action to take? So by now, right, tighter indicates that response is occurring in very specific conditions. Loose stimulus control indicates that response is occurring in maybe multiple situations, maybe too much, right? But if you want to establish tight stimulus control, what do you need to do? 
A, deliver punishment when the behavior occurs at the wrong time. Remember, we've talked about differential reinforcement, extinction and reinforcement. We're not talking about punishment here. B, provide continuous reinforcement whenever the response occurs. Well, if you do that, what are you doing? Well, you're reinforcing that response in the presence of a million different stimuli. If you reinforce um, in, in early learners who are just starting to talk, right? Uh, let's say they start saying hi. You know, everybody gets really excited because they say hi. And so they reinforce it, right? And they reinforce in the presence of mom. And then in the presence of chair, right? They say hi, and we reinforce. And then in the presence of uh, tree, hi, reinforce. So now mom has stimulus control, chair has stimulus control, tree has stimulus control. Very, very loose. Okay, we need to tighten that up. That's what would happen if we provide continuous reinforcement when that response occurs. So what you want to do is you want to limit when you deliver reinforcement to only a few stimuli. So now we're going to shape it up. Okay, no longer will they get reinforcement here or here, only in the presence of mom. So we get that really tight stimulus control. Stimulus generalization is the extent to which stimuli other than the SD acquire stimulus control. For example, if you teach a response in the presence of a stimulus shaped like a circle, stimulus generalization is more likely to occur for stimuli that are also shaped more or less like a circle. Back to our other slide, the more characteristic stimuli have in common, the more likely they are to gain stimuli, stimulus control over the same response. Now, if you aren't quite getting this, pause this video, back up, and start to understand the fundamentals. We don't rush to this part. Fluency is much more important than you doing a bunch of practice questions. You've got to be fluent before you can do anything else. Now, the more common elements of the stimuli, the more likely that stimulus generalization will occur. So question, whenever you see fireworks, you describe the fireworks as fiery and explosive. So here's our response, right? Fiery and explosive, and we have fireworks stimulus. Now, you also describe your friend this way whenever she is angry. So we have one response occurring in the presence of two different stimuli. What would that be considered? Well, of course, stimulus generalization. Response generalization would be we have stimulus one, we teach response one, and now we have response two, response three. That would be response generalization. Not overgeneralization because it's appropriate. So what's occurring is stimulus generalization. Maintenance, not a lot on maintenance. Um, Behavior, maintenance of behavior refers to lasting behavior change once instruction is stopped, right? So you teach for a week, you know, teach, 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 and then you stop instruction, okay? What we need to see in two weeks from now is that they still can do the skill, even with no teaching. That's maintenance. Maintenance check should be conducted routinely, at least when instruction is first ended. So if I'm teaching square, 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 no more instruction, then I need to every few days or few weeks or how often go back to square to make sure it's still maintaining. Fading reinforcement is an important aspect of programming for maintenance. If you provide continuous reinforcement during instruction and then instruction stops and reinforcement stops, what's going to happen? Well, that behavior is going to be put on extinction. That behavior is going to go away. You've got to fade your reinforcement. And remember, maintenance is a form of generalization because maintenance shows that that behavior can occur in different environments. So fourth graders are finally free from school for summer vacation. After two months, they go back to school and their math teacher gives them an ungraded quiz on the first day back of fundamental math skills they learned in fourth grade. What is the teacher testing? Well, the teacher's testing fundamental math skills in fourth, fourth grade because what happened? They went on summer vacation and didn't learn anything for two months. So she wants to see maintenance. Excellent. Thanks for watching. Again, these are going to come up over and over and over again. Fluency, fluency, fluency is the key. The more fluent you are, the easier the questions will be, the better you'll do. All right. So we'll continue next Sunday with B12. As always, check out behavioranalyststudy.com. Like, subscribe, let us know when you pass, work hard, study hard. See you soon.